Well, if you want to Today is Thursday, the 21st of October, 2004. You have to move closer so we can hear us. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm adjusting my hearing, so okay. the volume comes to me. Okay. Uh, today is Thursday, the 21st of October, 2004, where we are located at the 32nd Street Masonic Community Center at 2379 Union Road, Chief in New York. This tape is made by the Masonic War Veterans, Niagara Frontier Post Number 10, in partnership with the Library of Congress, Veterans History Project. My name is Marjorie Regan, and I'm doing interviews, and this is Mr. Thaddeus J. Simon. Mr. Simon, would you uh, state your entire name, your date of birth, and your service number, and then tell us how you got into the military? Well, I'm not usually old, but <laughs> I forgot my, uh... no, no, that's okay. If you forgot it, don't worry about it. Your service number? Wait, let me get that. All right. Well, I got a number here, 397-0566. Okay. Okay. And state your name, your full name, and your date of birth, please. My name is Thaddeus J. Siren, born February 2nd, 1923. Tell me about how you got into the military. In the military, I worked at Buffalo Ford in Buffalo, New York. Then I got my draft notice. So I was drafted from, uh, in February 43. I left from Roxy Theater on William Street. From there, we went to Fort Niagara. From Fort Niagara, we went to, we shipped out to Keesler Field, Mississippi. From Keesler Field, Mississippi, they shipped us back east. We went to uh, Atlantic City. In Atlantic City, they were uh, uh, making a group from the Air Force, whether you became a pilot, a navigator, a bombardier, or aerial gunner. So what they had, it was like a picnic being over there. But anyway, in order to get a good bus load or train load, they didn't have enough participants for to be a pilot or any other one of them. But they seemed to have a lot for aerial gunnery. So what they did, they sent me down to uh, Larry, Colorado for bombardment school learned to be all about armaments and everything else. After I graduated from there, then they sent me down to uh, Aerial Gunnery School in Laredo, Texas. On Laredo, Texas, what they did, they uh, gave us a furlough. So with all our flying clothes and everything else, we came to Buffalo, or where I lived. And it was funny because they gave us all the sheepskin, all the sheepskin. We put that at home. My mother started blessing herself because it looked so comical. I looked like out of like out of Mars, see? which in actual combat we didn't have those because by that time we had electric flying suits. So after we completed everything, we were assigned to a, a group. And that was in uh, Fresno, California. They sent us to the Mojave Desert. And that was for group training. That's when I was first put into 
a bomb that consists of all other men, and we were forcing or making up a bomb crew. So after all the training we had from, uh, from the Mojave Desert, we were ready to go overseas. So from there, we went to San Francisco, thinking that we're going to the Pacific, seeing that we're completely wet. But that was not the case. After we left San Francisco, we kind of went to Texas, Georgia, Florida. Next thing you know, we started going south. Went to British Guiana, uh, the European countries. Then we got into Brazil. From Brazil, we crossed with our own bomber over to Africa. From Africa, we went around the desert, the Mojave, and not the move, but uh, we were in Africa. And then we went for uh, traveling to Ireland. From Ireland, we had more extensive training until we were called in for replacements for whatever bomb group required additional bombers. And uh, the bomber we took over was a spank, a new silver bomber. It had plexi windows for the waste gunner and everything else. So when we finished training, our first bombing mission it went from a Cadillac to a Model A Ford. What a junky bomber we were first. Had more patches than a bum has on his, on his jeans. And I'll never forget that because our first mission was Hamburg, Germany. And all I could think about and was Earl Flynn, the Hollywood actor. In a movie when I was a kid, they had the Dawn Patrol. And that was when he had the scarf and he threw it over. And I was fantasizing that I was Earl Flint going in. That I, if I had a scarf, I swear, I would have done the same thing. So it was the young imagination because I was scared. And uh, in other words, with that old bomber, when you took off, as you got off the runway a few hundred feet, it would snap. That would mean it would, it would reach its level. But the snap, if you're in the back, my God, it sounded like a, like, like a building crash and scared the devil out of you until you got used to it, see? And then, continuous after that, we had all bombing missions from all the way from Munich the missions, the cities close to Switzerland, and we went all the way to Poland to bomb oil refineries. And that was, I can't describe, I can't describe in words what we saw. We got attacked by 120 German fighters, and we were flying the tail end Charlie, what they called the last element in the bomb group. And I went on the interphone and I said, uh, are we having British mosquitoes for escort? Then you had about a two or three minutes silence and somebody said, mosquitoes, your ass, those are Messerschmitt. As we were down, they flew up, they rocked their wings. They weren't going to attack us. But they went above and they attacked the 492nd bomb group. It was a new, new form bomb group that was, uh, we were already established. And they were more of the virgin type. They had to learn. So they went and attacked the higher element, which was the 492nd bomb group. Even today, I don't want to describe what I saw. Airmen were flying all over. As they were being shot, shot up, they were bailing out. I had to duck back in my bomber so they wouldn't hit my bomber. Yet, uh, the ones that parachuted, 
you kind of felt for them because you only had uh, less than 60 seconds to live if you bail out in the Baltic Sea. Because you would have hypothermia would set in and you would just you would just pass away. That was one of the longer missions. And when we came back, halfway coming back from the Baltic Sea, we got back to North Sea, my knees were given out. Because what happens, you have that heavy black suit. And the, the longer you wear it, the heavier it becomes. And uh, another thing, when the bombs drop, your knees kind of buckle because the plane goes shoots up. Right. Now, during that mission, I saw two or three different radio men fall out of the bomber. Every man, the radio man, used to be assigned when the bomb bay doors are open, he used to have a lever, a hydraulic lever, to keep pumping that to make sure the bomb bay doors stay open. If they creep, the bombs won't fall out. It was a safety factor. Yet, when the bombs fell, the plane would irk up. These people used to look to see where the bombs are falling. I'll tell you when. No parachute. I used to see, I used to wonder if, if, do they die before they hit the water? Is there a safety procedure, something for nature provides? Anyway, that was about my sixth mission. That's from, uh, from mostly with bombing with oil refineries. Oil refineries were the highest priority. And those were really, really tough because they used to have all bombardment. The toughest mission was, it was about my 16th mission, I guess. We were bombing Magdeburg, Germany, just outside of Berlin. As we were bombing, the formation was offset. What we had to do is go around and go to the flat area again. I think when you go to the flat area, maybe a lot of people disagree with me, but I swear you hold your breath for a couple minutes. You can't breathe, you're so scared. Because if you take the summertime, when you have a lightning storm, and the thunder hits and your house vibrates, multiply that by hundreds by the time you get out. When you get out of the flat area, see? Then when you get out of there, you have to worry about the German fighters. And uh, another mission, I forgot which one it was, but we are going over Bernburg, Germany, also doing that. Now, two German fighters came right up, and they dropped their wheels, wanted us to lower the wheels to land. Well, it was a, a, a real young tail gunner and another bomber. What he did, he went and took his machine gun and in a split second shot the two Germans right in front of my eyes. Shot them right down. Out down they went. When he was walking at the airfield, he used to have spastics made on his neck. I had many missions. I had to move aside on him. He was the guy, he was the wheel. But anyway, we bombed uh, way deep where we accidentally bombed Switzerland because the Swiss, the Germans made a city look like the Swiss. And we went and bombed Switzerland by mistake. I remember reading the reader died not the the, the newspaper we used to have, we used to read about that. But then again, just before they were killing Hitler, 
We were bombing uh, Munich, Germany. And again, you're always curious. But you look down on a clear day, and you can actually see the stadium where they had the 1936 Olympics. Goodness, it just was daylight. And we were thinking about uh, Jesse Owens, the way he was running, right? And the other mission was like, every mission has a story. But uh, the ones I remember the most was we were bombing a truck factory in uh, Brunswick, Germany. We were watching a bomb as the bombs were falling. And we were flying parallel with the railroad tracks going to the factory. So I was watching as our bombs dropped. We had 12, 12 500 pound bombs that when you drop. When they hit the rail cars, they hit side along the building. I can see that right now. I can picture that. I can, it's an imprint in my mind. And our bombs were going bing, 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 bing. Right along there, we had direct hit, and the European box cars were about half the size of ours. And I swore I ducked back subconsciously, thinking that it was going to come up. Okay. But uh, another time, we had the 2,000 pound bomb. Boy, that was along the table. We missed our formation that we had to assign to another group. Now, every mission you had, you had assigned different type bombs. Incendiary bombs used to be mixed up with your demolition bombs where as the demolition bombs would hit, the incendiary bombs would cause a fire, right? And we dropped the big one into the oil refinery. And why we had to drop them? Because we we uh, went, went with a different bomb group. Right? Other times you would have when you go into Germany, you'd hit winds. At one time we hit overcast winds of over 200 miles an hour. Our plane was like this almost in midair. In midair, and just stationary. Right? And then finally, the go down or something, or you get away from the current, and then you're able to go in. And uh, you were constantly looking, not only the flat, but the accidents of different bombers colliding. That was you had to be like this, all over looking. Because there was, uh, there used to be, uh, well, when a bomb, when a group starts to go out, you would have one or two different bombers that couldn't, couldn't go up. And as you go up, you could see the burning down below. It just scared the hell out of you. Okay. But as we were going, uh, I got hit over Hanover, Germany. And they had us pinpoint, the Germans had us pinpoint. Two bombers right alongside of me just disappeared. And I knew the next one would get us. Sure as God made green tomatoes, it hit us. And when it did, it blew up the engine. The engine uh, knocked out the heat. Then and then the shrapnel came right from the bottom of the plane and the shrapnel hit me hit me uh, below my hip it traveled all the way through, and this was stuck. Take a look at it. This was stuck in my back. It's the German shrapnel. 
Hang, hang on to that. We're going to get a okay. close-up of it. Now, the two corner pieces of, of this shrapnel is one here and one here. Every time I'm x-rayed by the veteran, Hold still. Hold on. Hang on to that. Okay. Every time I'm x-rayed by the veterans, I usually tell them, <coughs> you're going to have flashes of, uh, of two white spots, which would be the shrapnel, which would be the corner of this shrapnel right here. So what that did, it cut it cut my sciatic nerve. That's the reason I'm wearing the brace, because it cut the sciatic nerve in half. So, that I got bone infection from that. So, they had the choice of trying to clear up the bone infection, operate to get the leg straightened out, and by the time they got to the nerve, to sew the nerve up, they sewed that about two or three times. The elasticity it started getting weaker. It's like if you're connected to wires, and if you don't put them all together, it, it, it would be like right. little flashes. They, and then when they tried to sew up the nerve, they did. But I never got my feeling back for it. So I had all operations skin grabs, a uh, good many operations, but they were a general operation, like a skin graft, like uh, minor bone scraping, not, not the life and death. The life and death was where I had to call the family at three different times because the chaplain came over. It was uh, either yes or no. You're going to make it or you don't. So three times I made it. So then I was in Army Hospital for a long time, years. I guess, believe it or not, I got to like the hospital. I got a car from the government, but I was still in service. I took my car to, uh, to the Army General Hospital. And uh, it was just, it was just, uh, a choice. With my high rating, I used to get furloughed at sometime at 90 days home. I'd go home for 30 days and request and get an additional 30 days. 30 days. And, and uh, the reason I wear the brace, because like I said, the nerve never did come back. Now, the VA, the VA has been treating me I have nothing but excellent words for them. From the beginning all the way to today. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I got my flu shot. I walked in, I was next in line, next thing I know, I got the flu shot. But, uh, not in conclusion, but when I think about what's happening now in Iraq, Afghanistan, I look at the young faces. They're going to have a tremendous, tremendous job. They have to stay away from taboo. They can't drink. They can't, you can't feel sorry for yourself. You're going to have to take and spit everything out. You're going to have to take immediately, start some projects, and stay with it. Now, when I got out, I went bowling. The proprietor says, You'll have to leave because I don't have bowling shoes on. <coughs> so there was step one. I said, uh oh, I had to do something else. So what I did that all the years afterwards, I went fishing. My grandson took me and I caught a couple of fish and I was hooked on that. So the next 35 years, the things that I couldn't do, I couldn't horseback riding, uh, like now, you see the way I'm sitting, I can't sit that way in church. So, <laughs> the last 60 years, I'm always standing in church and back because other people have to kneel. And I couldn't. 
I got the ushers and I got used to me. They understood the situation, so they, so they just <laughs> accepted that. Sure. But, uh, uh, and these boys coming in, <coughs> if, what I did after that, I went fishing, and for the next 35 years, I was on Lake Erie catching yellow pike, blue pike, and everything else. I had to do it not to feel sorry for myself. So I had two boats, four engines, and I worked. I went to work for a broker. I went to school in GI Bill. And what did you study? What did you study? I studied accounting. Then after I graduated, I called. I got a call from the Veterans Administration to report for a job. So what I did, I reported to a food broker. So the next thing I know, it was railroad people coming in. Maritime people coming in. They were teaching me uh, transportation. What's this all about? Well, in other words, they were teaching me how to become a traffic manager. So I, I didn't do much of bookkeeping, but I learned everything from railroads and everything else. For the next 20 years, I became a traffic manager for a food broker. In other words, I had at least 25 accounts when I was working. And if you go into a grocery store, you cannot buy anything of those 25 accounts unless it came out of me. I was like a broker, like a real estate. They, they sell the house for you. So I lasted for 20 years with that. And then I was like a ball player or a football player, I was losing something. I couldn't go with the wind. I couldn't go with the wind. And it was time for me to retire. And then I retired. But uh, there was the schooling. Another factor, another factor I'm very proud of. I never took a day off, considering my situation. I never took a day off in 20 years. Every winter storm, I went. I don't know why. Maybe I was trying to prove that veterans are still very capable of business. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, then I got married, had two daughters. I live in West Seneca, Bill the Hole. And uh, now my wife died. In 97, and my two daughters come help me every day. So uh, there's not many dark clouds because I over, I kind of waited till the sun comes out. It always did. <laughs> Tell me about some of the pictures you've brought with you. Tell me about some of what you've brought with you. This here? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, here's a picture here. Okay. This is a picture that I got when I was getting my distinguished air medal. Okay. Okay. This is the bomber that I served in World War II. What kind of bomber is that? B-24 Liberator bomber. Okay. 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 Here's a picture on October 6, 03. We were in uh, Congressman Quinn's office. And what he did, I never got my, all my medals together. So here's a picture of him presenting my uh, Purple Heart and the rest of my medals. At on my chair. Here's the same one again, but a different right. picture. My daughter. And the one here, the fella at the end is my wife's brother, Blue. Hey, today is Thursday, the 21st of October. 
here's another one in Quinn's office. Okay. And here is a penny saver. Where? Here's my picture here. And here's a whole article. Hold up, there you go. Hold, hold on, hold on to it. Now please state the full name, date of birth, and service. All right, and there's the one picture of the penny saver. 6 January 43, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got that. Tell us about how you got into the military. Okay. <coughs> okay. Then here. Indian by birth. And during the '60s, I was uh, came over to Detroit, to Windsor, Ontario, to uh, take work. Here's a good article of Buffalo Evening News. On October 7th, U.S. Army. Oh, three. Okay. Okay. The Buffalo Evening News. It tells about the strap, no, I everything that I just showed you. Now you received the, di the Distinguished Flying Cross. You, you received the Distinguished Flying Cross. Distinguished Flying Cross. Four Air Medals. Four Air Medals. And a Purple Heart. Purple Heart. How did you feel about going in? What are the four Air Medals for? It was just the, uh, the four Air Medals? Every every certain amount of mission that you have, okay. Then, if they're real bad mission, then they will present it an air medal. Uh, okay. And then, when you complete your tour, which very few people ever did, you would get the distinguished flying cross. That's the blue one. Okay. Right. And the purple heart, quite obvious. Sure. sure. Can you put your hat on the table? Can you put your hat on the table so we can get a picture oh. of that? Different things like that, but it was a rewarding experience. I enjoyed the Okay, thank you. Now, another part of interest was when we were. Well, my boot camp was uh, basic industry. Look at that. Another a point of interest is, and, uh, as you can see, I don't have too many, uh, too many. I got my dentist home. Anyway, <laughs> I had pearl white teeth when I went in. From uh -huh. high altitude flying, you're flying six, seven. From boot camp, I went to Fort Bend, Houston. Texas, you're flying about 25, 26 miles a feet, uh, six, seven miles out. The filling you had in your teeth, the compressed air would expand and top up the filling. Huh. Yeah. It's one mission that we come back. And it was one tooth that was bleeding. When we landed, still with the humor, still with my flying suit, I went to Dennis. The dentist was playing baseball with the with the shield. And he was his turn at bat, and I said, "I'm talking to the dentist like this on a field." Wait, 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 wait. So he I tell you, the flight was an uproar. He was like bought the flying suit. I was running after him on all bases. If you snapped that, that would have that won some prize. Well, they had to hold up the game. And we went and as we drove and pulled it out, still with the full uniform. Now, another, everybody has mysteries. I'm 
God explained faith can happen. This I repeat it many, many times, and when I do, I have to grin myself because I still don't believe what I saw. We're coming back from Belgium after completing a mission, and a black plane swooped up on the left side of my bomber, swooped up, and a guy in a black suit waved to me. It sounds ridiculous. I mean, that's the last thing, I, but I can think. I still see him on my mind. So I wave back. It was less than 30 seconds. And she was flying. She went like this to me. I waved back. She pulled away. Nobody else saw him. I report that every when you came back, it was like you're doing right now. You come back to brief us, and you had to tell the officers every single thing that transpired during the mission. Thank you. Nobody else saw that. So, some some explanation was maybe I was hallucinating from maybe lack of oxygen. Maybe it was my imagination that helped. There's no explanation. That is too vivid of what I saw. Sure. No explanation. Thank sure. And uh, were you awarded any medals or No, that was a thing that uh, I had a sore point with because if you uh, again we're going back to you you have to take the strong imagination and then you have to say you had a duty to do, and you performed it. So, what I did, another thing, after I got discharged, I went to visit all hospitals. I saw everybody laying with their legs up in the air and everything else. And then I came back, and somebody asked me, why am I doing that? And I grinned, and I told them, I want to see how people get injured, not the way I did. They got injured on the whole front. And psychologically, it gave me, gave me a little bit of inspiration because more people get accidents. Shooting accidents. Oh, sure. And everything. So, uh, that was a strong factor for me to Now, you got your medals long after they should have been awarded to you. How did that happen that you didn't get them when you should have? Everything was, everything was, uh, okay. When I was overseas, you had to buy a bicycle. Everything was all spread out. I paid $60 for a bicycle, English bicycle. After I got to Army Hospital, somebody came back and they gave me $40. It's a code of honor. Sure. So I lost 20 bucks, but somebody else bought the next member bought my bicycle. And then the way you travel, after I got wounded, I went from England, Scotland, Newfoundland, no, Iceland, Newfoundland, New York, until I hit Mitchell Field, New York. Right. And eventually we get to your home base, which was Raymondham, Massachusetts. And that was a combination of neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery. And uh, <coughs> so the paperwork didn't catch up with you. The paperwork for your medal. It was moving. I was constantly moving. And maybe they were shipped, maybe they were doing something. But my daughter says, my daughter says, did you ever get all your medals? I said, I don't know. I, I got a couple of them. So my daughter took all but my discharge papers and she went to talk to, to uh, our congressman Quinn. She gave my discharge, my discharge 
papers indicated what I was entitled to. So we waited a little while, and when we went to his office, he was able to, to secure all the medals together, the TV and all that. How neat! Uh, my daughter wanted all that for for the future, sure. for grandchildren and all that. Thanks. And uh, when you were in Army Hospital, you never saw so many comic veterans as you had combat veterans. They were a show by themselves. <laughs> nobody, you couldn't, nobody had pity for them. If you had pity for them, another vet was coming to collect you in a face with a crutch. You had to grin and bear it. And we all learned what to do. There was no such thing as uh, feel sorry for me or anything else. Because somebody else was getting shut right out. Or he was the worst for than everything else. So I went to uh, quite a few Army hospitals, Fort Dix. I was at the uh, uh, Staten Island, Murphy General Hospital, Ravenham. The Murphy General is when I finally got this job. And yet, I was afraid to go outside without my uniform. The uniform became, from my teenage years to my grown-up years. And if I went out with a t-shirt, it took me months before I realized there's no MPs or anything. The uniform became part of it until I adjusted. Um, is there anything else you'd like to include on this tape that I haven't asked you about? Is there anything else you'd like to include on this tape? Well, it's like I said, for a future vet, like I said, stay out of the past. Start a hobby and start it quick when you don't have time to do it. You've got to have rough roads. It's going to take a lot of abuse and everything else. You'll be called, like I used to be called by any place. You know, being a stucker and all this. When did you gain out of the war? You had to learn to grin and bear it. Oh, you had to win. And that was it. Well, thank you very much for coming and doing this interview with us. And we appreciate you bringing everything to show us. And congratulations on all of your awards and medals.